So this is a lecture for April 29th, 2020 on biofilms and quorum sensing. And biofilms are something that have been around for millions of years, almost as long as bacteria have been. Um, but they're relatively new to the field of microbiology study. And so some of the things that we're going to talk about in this lecture are what a biofilm is, how a biofilm forms, and then why biofilms are becoming um, so well studied in relation to not only the natural environment, but also medical settings. And so in nature, um, while we do think of microbes as kind of single-celled organisms, most of them do not actually live in isolation. Um, many microbes, and bacteria included, live in communities of microbes um, called biofilms, which are groups of bacteria that are encased in a slimy, sticky matrix made of mostly polysaccharides. And biofilms are commonly associated with um, another surface. So in this case here on the left, the surface of a rock, they can also associate with the surface of water and can be found on the tops of streams and ponds. And so it's likely that in nature you've seen a biofilm before. Um, and though they might look relatively homogenous, um, they're actually both temporally and spatially diverse. And so within a particular biofilm, the makeup of microbes can vary from the top of that biofilm to the bottom where the biofilm is connected to the surface. And that's because once bacteria are suspended within this sticky matrix, they find it difficult to move within it. <clears throat> and so they tend to localize to specific places and end up generating gradients of oxygen as well as nutrients, um, pH, and quorum sensing molecules. And so, um, for example, here on the left, you can see an O2 gradient within a biofilm. And you can imagine that near the surface of the biofilm, there's a lot of available oxygen. And so aerobic bacteria tend to be found at the surface of a biofilm, whereas anaerobes or bacteria that don't require oxygen are found at the bottom or near where that biofilm is attached to a surface. Similarly, you can imagine that there's more nutrients available um, in the surface of the biofilm that's exposed to the external environment. And so that's where you tend to find most metabolically active or dividing cells. Whereas the deeper you go into the biofilm, the more chance you'll encounter a starving cell, a dormant cell, um, as well as some cells known as persisters, <coughs> which are very hard to kill and get rid of. And so you can see um, in this image here on the right, bacteria suspended in this um, polysaccharide matrix of a biofilm, and then just some illustrations using heat maps of high oxygen um, environment and low oxygen environment, as well as bacteria that tend to grow quickly versus those that grow slowly to illustrate this sort of spatial diversity um, and heterogeneity within a particular biofilm. And biofilms also vary um, temporally. And so the, a biofilm that's rather new um, will have a different makeup of microbes than one that has been matured or around for a long time. And so biofilms form on surfaces that are conditioned or have um, protein molecules um, attached to them. And bacterial cells can undergo deposition and absorption or they can basically bind to um, one of these surfaces. And in the beginning, when there are just several bacterial cells um, binding or adsorbing to the surface, the bacterial cells are still able to undergo this process of desorption or detachment. And so it's sort of a transient attachment of bacterial cells to a surface. Some will leave and some will stay. And as bacteria accumulate on the surface, they reach what's known as a quorum or a certain threshold of cells. And once there are enough cells binding to a particular surface, they begin to signal each other to secrete um, what are known as extracellular polymeric substances, which start to form that sticky um, semi-solid matrix. And there are many different extracellular polymeric substances some are polysaccharides, there are also proteins found within the matrix, um, and DNA as well. And so as the bacterial cells continue to secrete matrix, 
That matrix then in turn helps more bacteria adhere stably to the surface. And so it's sort of a, <coughs> a continuous process of bacterial cells making matrix and then more bacterial cells binding to and adhering to a surface. And within this matrix, the bacterial cells that exist can replicate and grow, particularly at the edge or this top portion of the biofilm here, um, and continue secreting more and more matrix until they become a mature biofilm. And once the biofilm is mature, pieces of it can actually uh, detach from the biofilm itself here and be moved to different environments, whether it's um, within the body or within the natural environment and colonize new surfaces um, and sort of propagate this biofilm formation onto an, another surface. And so what really signals that transition from transient attachment of bacteria to a surface to a biofilm formation is a process known as quorum sensing. And scientifically, the definition for this is a process where bacteria monitor their population density by sensing the levels of signal molecules released by these bacteria. Um, but what a quorum sensing process really is, is just <clears throat> the sensing of bacteria of signals in the environment and responding differently when it's in an individual situation than it does when it's in a group. And so in a low cell density, there are only a few signaling molecules available as you can see here indicated by the triangles, but the more bacteria that exist or the higher the cell density, the more signaling molecules they secrete. <laughs> and once they reach a particular threshold density, the quorum is met and genes associated with this quorum sensing can be transcribed. And so once again, in a low cell density, you can see the signal molecules here most of the time, they are small peptides. They're also often known as autoinducers. And when there's one or two cells, there's not very many signaling molecules available. However, once there are many cells, there's many signaling molecules in the environment. Um, this quorum is met and this threshold is met. And the autoinducers or signaling molecules can trigger transcription of related genes um, in response to whatever this quorum sensing behavior is. And so in this case, once the quorum is met and there's a high cell density, a biofilm can begin to form. <laughs> and in addition to biofilm formation, quorum sensing or this idea that you have to meet a certain threshold of cells before the, the bacteria behave as a group rather than as individuals can regulate a lot of different processes. <clears throat> One of the more common ones is virulence or the infectivity of bacteria, as well as antibiotic production. Quorum sensing can also regulate conjugation and competence um, and allow transfer of DNA in certain situations where a quorum has been met. And what you can see here in this image on the right is just signal peptides or autoinducers that are involved in quorum sensing as well as the organisms that have been shown to have quorum sensing mechanisms, and then the different functions that quorum sensing can regulate. And so you'll notice that virulence is a pretty common one that's regulated by quorum sensing. And this is likely because in order to really infect and achieve um, kind of a disease causing element in a host, there needs to be enough bacteria around to really make it worth it for those bacteria to try to infect a host and to increase their virulence. Um, and so you can imagine that one or two bacteria probably wouldn't want to do this because there's not really enough bacteria to ultimately cause any damage to the host. However, if you have hundreds and hundreds of bacteria, the chances of them infecting and successfully um, causing a disease in a host is much higher. And so they use quorum sensing to shift their behavior from kind of an individual survival mode to a group dynamic. And there's one really cool example of this in the bacteria Vibrio fischeri, um, <coughs> where quorum sensing can actually control transcriptions of bioluminescence genes or kind of glow in the dark genes. And um, I'm not gonna talk about it here, but there's a really great YouTube video that I'm posting on Moodle 
that will explain the mechanism of quorum sensing in these bacteria and how that relates to um, this squid, this bobtail squid here. Um, quorum sensing can also be used to regulate virulence, as I said before. It was discovered in the bacteria Streptococcus pneumoniae, and there is a peptide that is released by cells, um, in this case the S. pneumoniae, as their density increases. And when the concentration of that peptide gets really high, it actually triggers the S. pneumoniae to become competent or able to take in DNA via transformation. And it also triggers any competent cells to kill or eliminate non-competent cells from the population. And so quorum sensing can actually not only um, favor the release of virulence factors, which will allow the S. pneumoniae to invade tissues and cause disease, but it can also make this population of S. pneumoniae cells really susceptible to taking up DNA from the environment, including um, antibiotic resistant genes. And P. aeruginosa is another bacterium that uses quorum sensing really effectively. It does this to, to form biofilms. Um, and in addition to the formation of biofilms, quorum sensing in P. aeruginosa can also help um, contribute to antibiotic resistance by promoting the transcription of those efflux pumps, which pump drugs out of cells. And as well, it can increase resistance to the host cells and depress the immune response. And so when P. aeruginosa meets its quorum threshold and the quorum sensing requirements are met, it becomes really difficult to treat in patients because it can form this biofilm and also is really resistant to host immune defenses. And so for these reasons, biofilms can present a real a problem in medical settings. And so, as I said previously, biofilms can secrete virulence factors that can cause disease. Within the matrix of the biofilm itself, antibiotic resistance plasmids can travel and um, be passed between competent cells. And so antibiotic resistance can be acquired pretty easily throughout all the microbes in the, in the biofilm. And additionally, you can imagine that trying to treat a biofilm with antibiotics might not work as well as treating an individual cell because those antibiotics can only penetrate this top layer of the biofilm seen here in yellow but not reach all of these um, persister cells or other cells on the bottom that are actually attached to the surface. And so these are just some examples of cross sections of catheters taken from patients and you can see that there's actually biofilm formation in a lot of medical implant devices as well as in skin grafts here. This is a foot that's growing a biofilm on top of a skin graft. And so because they're easily able to attach to surfaces and they're very hard to get rid of, and this matrix is very difficult to dissolve, biofilms um, work really well to the advantage of the bacteria. They give them um, an antibiotic resistant, nutrient rich, stable environment in which to live, but they make it difficult for us to treat infections. And one thing that some people are proposing, particularly in terms of medical implants, are the use of slip, super slippery surfaces for tubing like catheters or other medical devices um, because biofilms wouldn't be able to attach and adhere to them. And so what you can see here is both ketchup and mustard on the surface that's normally used for a medical implant sticking really well, as you can imagine a biofilm might. But there are these different surfaces made in the lab um, called X-slips where both the ketchup and the mustard can slide right off and they actually tend to um, impair the formation of biofilms as well. And so thinking about biofilms in terms of treatment of diseases for humans um, is a really important thing and it's a really big concern in terms of combating the antibiotic resistance crisis as well because biofilm formation um, as I said before, can also allow new microbes to acquire antibiotic resistance.